Hey, it's Mike here, and today, DHA supplementation, in particular, internal vegan battles over long chain omegas. My omegas are longer than yours. No, my omegas are longer. <laughs> We've touched on this topic a lot lately, particularly in the realm of logically flawed reasons to quit a vegan diet by eating fish to get omegas that are from algae anyway, the exact same omegas. But recently and in the past, throughout the last months, I've gotten messages saying, hey, I heard that DHA supplementation actually can be dangerous. It's probably news to a lot of you, but this largely stems from a video with Dr. Clapper, where he says it could be a risk for prostate cancer, among other things. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, and DHA is one, has long been suspected of making cell membranes unstable and possibly increasing uh, their chances uh, to undergo malignant degeneration. And there has been published research by reputable investigators connecting high levels of DHA with prostate cancer. And that this is possibly from these omegas increasing the cell permeability and letting more carcinogens into your cell. This all sounds very scary, but I do want to say I definitely have respect for Dr. Clapper. The way that he presents this is very open-minded. He says he's open to new research changing his mind. And I will say there is research that puts my mind at ease. So we'll cover that research, some research on prostate cancer, and just some more interesting facts about DHA. Let's go. Let's get to the DHA basics. As I've said before, we take plant-based ALA that we eat and we extend that fatty omega chain into EPA and then longer into DHA. And the debate isn't whether or not this does occur, it's whether or not it happens to an optimal degree. And it's kind of hard to determine this optimal degree because as I agree with Dr. Clapper, what he says here is, None of the studies indicating low levels of DHA in tissues have been done on vegans eating an ALA abundant diet like I described with ample amounts of greens and ground flax. The vast majority of studies on DHA production have been done on people eating omnivore diets, wherein the preformed DHA they eat in the meat every day probably down-regulates their enzymes that produce their own DHA in their cells, so it gives us the impression that everyone has difficulty making DHA out of ALA. So this is true and it's a valid concern, but in the same way that I can't just let people like carnivore dieter Sean Baker say that my diabetic fasting blood sugar levels are okay because my body different. <laughs> And when you add how a larger portion of vegans are eating these sort of standard American vegan diets where they're replacing animal foods, it seems like these omnivore studies should still be considered. At this point, I should probably state my position on these supplements. I don't think it's known for sure that not taking these supplements but getting enough ALA is gonna be harmful, but I am quite certain that taking these EPA and DHA pills at moderate doses will not have any negative effect, possibly have some very good positive effects, such as preventing the natural brain shrinkage of the human body through late aging. The brain stop seems to be a major motivator for Dr. Greger's recommendation, and that has been challenged, so why don't we just hop right into the brain stuff? DHA is of course a fat that plays a role in the structure of the brain. And so it's been no surprise that several epidemiological studies have shown an association between higher DHA status and better brain volume and things like that. But it's better to look at randomized control trials such as this one that Dr. Greger mentions, which found that by giving older people DHA, their brain shrank about 60% less than the control group at about six and a half months. In old age, the brain appears to shrink about 1% per year, so we can imagine after three decades of old age, instead of losing 30% of your brain volume, these people might have lost only 12 with the DHA. They also did better on what is called executive function, which is your higher cognition, your prefrontal lobe, which I view to be highly valuable. I hope you do too. And again, it's worth mentioning, we're talking randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So unlike other studies that are just observing and possibly finding lifestyle associations for this, now they gave one group those along a chain omega-3s and the other they didn't. And that's the result they got, very compelling. But a criticism of this study is that they were taking quite a bit of this DHA. We're talking, you know, between EP and DHA around two grams, 2000 milligrams combined. And vegans are generally only taking a few hundred milligrams of algae. However, these brain results were achieved at only about a 1.5% increase in omega index, which as we'll talk about when we talk about the amounts appears to be achievable in these vegan common doses. 
The main point here is that into older age, there appears to be a clinically demonstrated benefit to taking these, which should absolutely be on the list of pros and cons. You know, I don't think Dr. Clapper weighed that as much as he should have. However, this benefit might not occur until you're into or past your 50s. And that comes from this randomized control trial that came out 2019. I haven't heard Gregor talk about this one. They did a very similar thing. They gave people a reasonably high dose of DHA plus EPA, and they measured their brain volume. Problem here is it found no difference in morphology or neurophysiological performance. However, it did find a slight improvement in executive function in those with lower levels to start with. Main differences here is that this was only about four or so months and the previous one was six and a half months. Also, again, we're talking about that younger group. The age comparison is 30 to 54 years of age for this one versus 50 to 75 years for the previous study. But I think between this study reinforcing that you don't wanna have those lower levels of DHA for executive function and just that it's older age where this happens, you wanna be sure that you're getting this and having a good amount, especially when you're old. Probably the biggest brain point that Clapper makes is that no, you shouldn't be worried because there doesn't appear to be a connection between low DHA and Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Do they contribute to Parkinson's disease or dementia? Uh, accredited dementia researchers around the world do not list DHA deficiency as a cause of dementia. Not even a vegan diet is on the risk factor list. So is this a real connection we have to be concerned about? Well, I agree that Parkinson's is probably not caused by low DHA. There are some very compelling associations here that were compiled in this 2019 review. The results are more compelling for Alzheimer's, but look, it showed a lower risk with higher DHA in the Rotterdam study. However, others showed no association and several trials did show lower Parkinson's disease depression, which is at least worth mentioning. But looking to Alzheimer's, it's associated with lower DHA levels. It's unclear as to whether or not this is a result of the brain not being able to deliver all the nutrients properly or perhaps an association of lifestyle or who knows maybe there is a causal relationship because after all it is brain structure and we also have associations for dha and dementia that are very compelling, and that's from the Framingham study. High versus low blood DHA was associated with 47% lower relative risk of all dementia and 39% lower relative risk of Alzheimer's, and that is again quite compelling. But all this brings up the question, what is the ideal amount? We know that these are not cheap, although we'll talk about how prices are changing, but you know, is there a too much or is there a too little to get anything done here? And well, as Dr. Greger says, from studies it appears that being over the cutoff of a 4.4 omega index is the difference between between seeing accelerated cognitive decline or not. It appears that you don't need to be slamming down that several pills a day to reach that, you know, 1500 to 2000 milligrams of combined long chain omega threes to get an adequate amount. And that brings me to this study that actually looked directly at vegans who started out with lower levels and it gave them 250 milligrams combined, which is pretty low. I mean, we're talking 170 milligrams of DHA and about 80 of EPA. And it got them about a 1.7% rise on that omega index, crossed them on average over the threshold of 4.4. Yeah, I'd probably start it from a lower amount, but this rise was roughly equivalent to the rise that was seen in that first randomized control trial on brain shrinkage. And this study was only four months long, unlike the six and a half months of that first study. So it's unclear how much it would keep going up if you keep eating it, taking it, but uh, that's the result. It's also worth mentioning that the WHO and others suggest that pregnant women get 200 milligrams of DHA a day. And looking to this study on pregnant women, they found that yeah, the 200 milligrams of DHA doubled their DHA breast milk content compared to the control group. It is worth mentioning though, that there are organizations that suggest higher than 200 milligrams of DHA for pregnant women. Just wanted to put that out there, but looking to cost, it is nice to see that the cost of all this is coming down. I mean, looking at this Amazon listing, we're talking about $16 for 800 milligrams of DHA, as well as some EPA. You know, you could stretch this out at a lower dose if you're willing to do it to be about, you know, $4 a week, which is, you know, a single Starbucks drink. Oops, I said that wrong. I meant $4 a month. That is a four month supply at 200 milligrams a day. I also wanna mention, like I could be slapping down affiliate links and promoting and selling all these things all the time, but I rarely do promotional things to try and stay neutral, especially on things like supplements. So if you want to keep me neutral, you can support my Patreon. Don't worry, I'll stay neutral on things like this either way. And when talking about money here, I would note that trying to get your DHA, this supernatural way of eating fish uh, is way more expensive at this point, especially if you're focusing on stuff that isn't horrible and farmed and actually has DHA because a lot of fish 
have basically no DHA in them. And then the comparison of fish oil to algae oil is really starting to balance out. I mean, these are the main listings, most sold ones for fish oil, probably, you know, more expensive than the one I showed you. Especially if you just want to be safer in terms of any toxin bioaccumulation like PCBs, you're going to have to go with a trusted brand, which is even more expensive. But algae, you don't need to worry about that. It's the original source. No bioaccumulation up the food chain. But that fish toxin concern, get this, is actually what drove DuPont to genetically engineer yeast to make EPA and DHA. Apparently they can do it large scale, pretty cheaply. I don't know why they aren't. All right, I feel like I waited too long, but now let's get into those concerns that Clapper has with DHA. Here he is. Well, we've recently learned that taking preformed DHA retards the metabolism of the EPA one step below it. As a result, the EPA starts backing up and it accumulates in the tissues. Is this a good thing? Nobody knows. Are fatty acids building up with the EPA in my cells and uh, being oxidized and generating free radicals in my eyes and my brain because the EPA is not being metabolized? Nobody knows. And he also calls into the question the accuracy of blood tests here. Uh, the plasma lipids are strongly influenced by one, the, the fat you've been eating in the week or two before you get the blood test, not reflecting true fat balance in your tissues. And second, the plasma level in the blood of DHA is determined by how quickly the DHA is cleared out of the blood cells. So a low DHA level might really just reflect efficient clearance of the fatty acids out of your plasma rather than a dietary deficiency saying you need to take more DHA. And the same with the omega-3 index uh, that measures lipids in the red blood cells. The results vary widely from laboratory to laboratory by a factor of three. Uh, a 2% at one lab might be a 6% at another lab. And my response to that is regardless to the consistency between labs and perhaps blood clearing and things like that, if you are able to just demonstrate a rise in this status in the amount that's in your body or just put more into your body, you're gonna be better off and to address the concern that there would be too much building up in the body, that EPA in particular causing some oxidation and these other issues like permeability. Zooming out, asking the question, do high levels of these omegas appear to increase the risk of death? And that brings me to this meta-analysis. Death matters and looking at blood levels, we're talking about 20% lower all-cause mortality with the high versus low groups of EPA and DHA. Nothing to scoff at. But this is where I appreciate Dr. Clapper's concern in questioning this because if you look closely at the chart for intake, not for blood levels, for intake, you can see a little bit of a U relationship, meaning that if you keep on going higher and higher, you start losing a little bit of a benefit. You're still way better off than people at baseline or lower, but you see around that 400 milligrams to 1200 milligrams a day seems to be a sweet spot. However, this could just be reflecting people who are slamming down fish and having maybe negative effects of saturated fat, animal protein, et cetera, who knows? Either way, when you're talking about the concern of oxidation occurring and doing some damage in the blood, the higher the EPA, the higher the DHA, that's a linear relationship with lower mortality. So that at least puts me at ease. And this death benefit is probably largely due to a lower cardiovascular disease risk because EPA in particular has blood thinning properties. And then you could say, oh, well, those are all tests on omnivores and I agree with you, but the leading killer of vegans still appears to be heart disease as well. So until like, we don't really have any of that. We still should be concerned about heart disease. Little caveat here, it appears that some of the studies within this meta-analysis were funded or connected in part to the Omega industry, fish oil industry, which is a billion dollar industry, but there doesn't appear to be studies in any meaningful amount showing an increased risk of mortality. So that's the key. All right, finally, let's get to prostate cancer. It's the most common male cancer. It actually runs in my immediate family as well. So I understand being afraid here, but we gotta look at the research. First, let's start with the scary research, <laughs> which came from the SELECT trial, which is a little bit misleading because it was a trial on vitamins, no, but they also just looked at associations and they found that aggressive prostate cancer was increased by 70% in those with higher DHA levels. Again, that was association, so it can't prove causation, but when you throw in some other studies like this one, which found a 40% lower prostate cancer risk with higher DHA, it becomes a little bit muddied and that brings me to this pretty large meta-analysis on 44 studies on this topic. And they found no clear relationship. So either you can attribute any negative to fish or just really high levels 
and which don't somehow affect mortality. And if you think that the really high levels are the problem, then you can simply just take EPA and DHA in a medium to low dose, which appears to be adequate. So unlike the case of processed meat, there appears to be a legitimate case for moderation here. And if you're still concerned about those carcinogens seeping into those uh, sort of leaky cells, well, from this study, there appears to be some, you know, pretty compelling benefits of DHA on cancer. You know, they say it's been shown to enhance many cellular responses that reduce cancer cell viability and decrease proliferation. As a result, I just no longer feel comfortable telling people who are eating an ALA-rich diet, including a tablespoon or two of ground flax and chia seeds most every day, to spend hundreds of dollars each year to swallow an algae oil supplement that alters their natural EPA metabolism, likely makes their cell membranes more permeable to toxins and carcinogens, has never been shown to prevent dementia, and has been associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer. All the while their liver is likely making all the EPA and DHA they need. I am quite open to the possibility that new research may change my mind regarding DHA supplementation for most vegans. So this is where I definitely have a lot of respect for Clapper for just even saying he's open to research in the future, changing his mind. A lot of people don't do that. Um, but the point that I have to emphasize here is that the amount of people that are eating a high ALA diet with low omega-6s, because omega-6s decrease that ALA to EPA and DHA conversion, is probably really, really low, sadly. You know, most vegans are slamming down omega-6 rich oils, and even the ones who are trying to eat chia and flax oftentimes aren't even grinding it up, which isn't as digestible, so it just seems the safest to be like, get that omega status going up. And while mentioning conversion, one quick real tangential fact <laughs> is that it appears, once again, turmeric is awesome here. You know, the active ingredient in turmeric, curcumin, was shown to increase ALA conversion as well as increase brain DHA content but it was in mice, but turmeric and curcumin appears to be so good for you. It's just one more awesome thing about it. So special thanks to viewer and Apex buddy by the username Finest for sending me that little piece of information. In conclusion, Clapper and I agree on a lot of things like how there's a lack of research in particular on vegans who are eating a high ALA, low omega-6 diet, but our conclusions are opposite. He's concerned about things like prostate cancer, blood cell oxidation, and permeability of cells, but I just don't see those being a threat considering, A, the ability to reach adequate status by taking a moderate dose, and B, the lower mortality of people with way higher levels than people taking a moderate dose will probably ever get. 20% lower mortality, I mean, come on. And I would even say, I would bet, just from an intuitive non-scientific perspective, that people on that high ALA, low omega-6 diet would probably reach adequate levels of DHA. But we're in a position where we can go higher and perhaps reach optimal, more preventative levels. You know, and those could be even higher than the natural course of human aging. You know, by having slightly higher DHA levels, we might be able to preserve that brain function for longer. And that's something I'm massively concerned about, as afraid as I am of prostate cancer the mixed data on that is just not as compelling. All right, so once again, please be respectful to Dr. Clapper. I'm excited to see the price of all this go down. I would like to see it integrated into some more foods, not just like a few milligrams in ripple milk, because then people would at least for sure not be way too low because we're talking about being too low and going to normal, but then also going from normal to higher, which might have added benefits. All right, let me know down below what you think about all this. I'm gonna keep taking DHA. It's pretty much the only supplement that I take as a pill. I tend to get my B12 from fortified foods and my levels are good. And I will though seasonally take some extra vitamin D. So that's about it for me. And there are some people that don't particularly like Patreon. So you can also just Venmo at M-I-C the vegan, Mike the vegan, or just PayPal me at Mike the vegan at gmail.com. All right, feel free to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Thank you for watching. <laughs>